Elise uh, Paradis has a PhD. She is an award-winning uh, researcher, mentor, and speaker with an expertise in teamwork. She uses a range of methods in her research from con content analysis to ethnography, interviews, bibliometrics, and scoping um, reviews. She uh, obtained her PhD from Stanford in 2011, and she joined the Leslie Dan Faculty of Pharmacy at the University of Toronto in 2015, and also holds appointments in medicine, sociology, and at the Center for Critical Qualitative Health Research. She held a Canada Research Chair in Collaborative Healthcare Practice until 2019, when she left the University of Toronto to work at, at Facebook. Her emphasis is now on maximizing software engineers' well-being and productivity through her research. And this is actually how we got to meet each other through our common interest on developer productivity. Elise um, is currently working with Chisel and with me, and uh, we're thrilled to have her at uh, the University of Victoria for the next couple of months. And she's working on a critical review of the literature on software engineering. And she's trying to answer the following questions. How do authors, the authors of the papers that is, conceptualize software engineers? And how are they considering software engineers as full and social beings or as automatons? So super interesting uh, questions that uh, maybe we'll share a little bit of insight on that with you maybe next week or during the term. Um, hi guys, I'm delighted to be here today. As um, Peggy said, the paper I shared with you for this week is a bit um, esoteric. Um, so we're gonna unpack it together and I hope that by the end of the presentation, you'll have a better sense for why we should care about these things. Um, and what you can do with theories, theoretical frameworks and conceptual frameworks in your, your research. Um, for us, for the authorship team of this paper, um, this area was really difficult um, because, well, well let's, let's do this side and then I'll skip back. It was very difficult for us to come to an agreement initially about theory, theoretical frameworks and conceptual frameworks, because two of us are constructivist researchers. So we ask questions about meaning and behavior and um, these more subjective parts of the human experience. And we were working with two experimentalists who had very different views on what a theory is and why we use theory. So we were trying to write a paper and come to a place where we could teach our students um, in a way that would make sense across two very distinct traditions, right? And at first we didn't really know how to do that. We really struggled because we have been used to um, think so differently about these two research paradigms that we represent that um, it was really, really hard to write. It, it's uh, you know, uh, hard to write because of the, the, the meat of it, the intellectual content, not the collegial relationships, uh, which is a good thing. So um, before I move forward, I'll just do, say a little something about the field of knowledge that uh, I used to be in, which is health professions education research. So health professions education research is interested in all the components that come to the education of healthcare providers, right? So from nurses to pharmacists to physicians to physical therapists and respiratory therapists, all of these people, right? So in some ways it's very similar to software engineering research and in some ways it's different. So one difference is that we study healthcare professionals and software engineering research studies engineers. Both are fairly recent interdisciplinary fields, you know, with roots in the 60s and 70s. And both are interested in finding uh, practical solutions to real world problems, right? We're not esoteric fields like philosophy or mathematics, right? Like we have really concrete interests in knowledge to solve real world problems. And there's an interesting tension in what we do between the research that is written for researchers and that the research that is done for users, right? That the software engineers or the healthcare providers versus our peers with PhDs who write and publish together. So I think that there's an interesting parallel here between fields uh, because we, we have a lot of similarities and some tiny differences that I think are fairly easy to bridge. And I think that for me as someone who had spent, you know, eight years in healthcare doing the transition um, to Facebook and software engineering was not, oops, 
as hard as one would think. Let me uh, activate back the light I got uh, put in the dark. So with this paper, we wanted to answer the following four questions. So first, what is a theory? And as I said, again, like for each of these two main research paradigms, how is a theory distinct from a theoretical framework? Does the term conceptual framework refer to something different from a theory or a theoretical framework? And do these teams, terms mean different things to different research traditions, right? And why we cared about that is one, we are teachers, right? So we wanted our students to, who do research to do great research and to be able to speak the same language, but also in our everyday lives, you know, we wanna do the best research possible. And one of the components of that is speaking the same language and theories are a way that we can speak the same language across different fields of inquiry and across different projects. So our big aha moment in writing this paper came when we started paying attention to the word work, you know? Um, so once we started to think like, is work the key to it? We're like, yes. Oh, slides are frozen. Oh, ah, work, 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 right? Uh, like, you know, who knows this song that I'm referring to? Like the big uh, Rihanna and, um, and Drake song, right? Like we started joking around that we were work, 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 working on things. So from a theory, the researcher does the work to create a theoretical framework. Well, from theory, we went to theoretical framework. And then from concepts, we went to conceptual framework, right? So the big difference is in the work that we put into our um, making theory ours, making the concepts ours, so that they actually align with the study that we're trying to do. So um, what is a theory? So generally a theory is a set of propositions that are logically related, expressing the relations among different constructs and propositions. You've seen this in the Schulberg article, right? In other words, a theory is an abstract description of the relationships between concepts that help us understand the world, right? So the core components are concepts, right? Or constructs. Um, and relationship among, relationships among them. And the key to a theory is that uh, as this guy is looking into his, his vial, right? It, a theory on a shelf is useless. It is only useful when you can use it in the real world to understand what's going on in the real world, okay? And this is where the work of writing a theoretical framework happens, right? You take the theory, you work on it to apply it to your research. So the theoretical framework then is a logically developed and connected set of concepts and premises that the researcher creates to scaffold a study. It is work. It is the making of theory into something that is yours and specific to your research question and your context. Does that make sense? So similarly, then we have the conceptual framework, which is the overall justification for why and how a given study should be conducted, right? So that's the broader, con the broader framework that includes your theoretical, theoretical framework, but also describes the state of knowledge, the gaps in understanding that make you ask the question that you're interested in answering, and that outlines the project methodology. And all of these things are important to put in a broader conceptual framework because the alignment between these parts is what will make a study coherent, right? If you don't have this coherence and your theory does not align with your methods and you will do an activity later, later that, that tries to get to that, you are not able to deliver such a coherent study and make such a big contribution. Sounds good? Okay, so you have seen in the readings from last week what is deductive uh, thinking and, and inductive thinking, right? Generally, deductive thinking is what we are exposed to in high school, for instance, where we have the scientific methods and we have 
hypothesis testing, and that is what we do. So you start from a hypothesis that is from a theory that generates some hypotheses, and then you test those theories in a specific context. In contrast, you have inductive uh, approaches to theory that go from the real world, what is your, uh, your everyday context, and tries to generate theory. And these two things get into a loop from deductive to inductive so that we can push knowledge forward, right? So, um, you know, the story about Newton and the apple, right? what Newton did with his apple is inductive thinking, right? There was an apple that fell down and that needed an explanation. So then he wrote a theory about gravity and then it was tested and um, it became more of a law, right? And then we had increasingly better understandings of gravity and of the different forces in the universe and we were able over time to refine science that way, right? So this is a looping effect from deductive to inductive and back. Similarly, like there's a difference between the subjective, which is what a person experiences, right? Like that guy and how happy he is about his bullseye, right? That's a subjective experience of throwing the arrow. And you have the objective version of it, which is the arrow hit the bullseye, right? And these two things are also important to whenever you're dealing with humans and social phenomena is you have a, a personal subjective experience, and then you have an external, more objective experience, right? And science is, in, is concerned with both of these things, the subjective uh, personal experience and the objective um, manifestations of that experience, right? And again, there's not one better way of approaching science. These two things should come together to give us a better understanding of what's going on, you know? Without this guy's face and smirk and pride, we don't have the full, full picture. Without noticing what he's so proud about, we don't have the full picture. Sounds good? So I just did a quick review of deduction, induction, and then subjective, objective. We're good with that? The components fit in place? Any questions at this point? Okay, looks like everybody's following me till now. Brilliant. Okay. I love that picture, by the way. Isn't he cute? And the, like, I'm assuming it's a big sister who's not like all that excited. It's like, oh, look at him again, yeah. you know, like showing yeah. off. Like there's yeah. so much in this photo. I love it. Yeah, that's a great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so now when we talk about objectivist deductive research, right, do we have a better understanding when, once we've disentangled objective, subjective, deductive, inductive? When we under, do we understand, we have a sense for objective, deductive now, which includes the language you have seen last uh, over the past few weeks is post-positivist and positivistic research, right? So we believe that there's an outside world. Let, let, let's, let me skip to the slide. So what is uh, objective is deductive research? So as we've said, deductive research involves going from general abstract conceptualizations uh, to observable and measurable data in a specific context. So objectivist deductive research rests on two assumptions. First, that there's an external reality that is out there and independent of the researcher. And two, that this reality can be understood by collecting objective unbiased data about reality. So if I can get a, a show of, of thumbs up or hands up for those who believe that one, that one, that number one is true, that there is an external reality out there that exists independent of you as a researcher. Hands up if you think that this is true. Don't be shy. Eh. I see. Come see, come saw. Yes, some yes. Okay, mostly yeses, it seems. Oh, and good, lots of thumbs up. Thank you, guys. Okay, 
but some people who have abstained. So we'll get to you guys later. And then that reality can be understood by collecting objective unbiased data about reality. Who believes that is true? Okay. Eh, I see some uncertain heads, mixed beliefs, and that's good. That's good. You're, you guys are critical of, of the, the world out there and of science in general. That's good. I love it. So let's talk quickly about surgery. Um, I know it's, it's, well, it's not that far from some software engineering. There's a lot of software uh, in the modern operating room. So before I left uh, the University of Toronto, I was running this big study of the surgical safety checklist. Who has heard about the surgical safety ch checklist? Yeah, some people, a very few people. Okay, so the surgical safety checklist is a tool that was developed by a group of um, surgeons, um, mostly from Harvard. Atul Gawande was the leader of this and the World Health Organization. And they were tasked with creating a tool that would improve patient safety in the operating room. So they had the lofty goals and then they eventually decided to build a checklist with the different procedures that surgical teams should follow to ensure the well-being of their patients, right? So it starts at the beginning of the surgery, like when the patient is rolled in, there's a set of things that they're supposed to do. Then there's before the, they start cutting the patient, there's other sets of things that they need to do. And then at the end of the procedure, there's another th set of things that need to be done to make sure that, for, for example, there's no sponges left in the patient um, and that they have collected all the specimens that they need and that they have a plan for where to send the patient. And if there are specific medications that they should give this person, et cetera, et cetera, right? So the initial research around this surgical safety checklist was very much deductivist, objectivist research. They had a tool and they wanted to evaluate it and answer the question, does this thing work? And the way they defined work in this context was better patient safety outcomes, right? So they used the data on whether or not the checklist was filled and done in the operating room. They compared that with outcomes and they were able to say that um, the surgical safety checklist reduced mortality and morbidity for patients who had observed, um, who had been in cases with the surgical safety checklist by 30%. So that's huge, right? Where you used to have 130 deaths, you now have 100. Where you used to have 130 infections, you have 100. So that was seen as a major, major win in the healthcare safety space. Okay, so that's an example of deductivist research. Why? Because we believe that there's a reality out there that exists independently of the researcher and that we can measure it objectively. Make sense as an example? Question. Does the yes. measurement, who's checking off the items on the list? Is there a chance that checking off the items makes them more conscientious of you know, does it affect the outcome? So that's an amazing question. And if you're okay, we'll hold until I wrap back up with the, um, the example in, of inductive research that we did in that space. Sounds good? Okay, good. So let's move forward. Yes, were there other questions? Does this relate to the one that pilots use? I'm assuming this was before it, but is that No, the, actually this was around 2009, 2010 is when they um, did that research. So it came after and was inspired by the aviation industry. Okay. So good observation. Okay. Okay, so within this paradigm of deductivist, objectivist research, a theory is the starting point for research as it helps with hypothesis generation. A study adds new knowledge in this 
uh, research tradition by adding another building block of evidence to support, refine, or challenge a theory. Right? So this implicit theory of this, this um, initial checklist study was we have seen in other contexts that human error, like in the context of aviation, um, you, human error is lowered when we have a structured tool like a checklist to help people follow steps towards patient safety. The question is then, does it apply in healthcare? Yes, so you, you've transferred something that you knew worked in one context into a new context and you tried that, right? So the researcher then puts the theory into action as a theoretical framework by articulating why the current context is a legitimate area of study for a given theory. Here, this theory that checklists help humans to remember things and act more safely by shaping the constructs of interest, like what are we supposed to measure in this context, right, of the surgical safety checklist, and we transfer the innovation from aviation into healthcare. Articulating the specific language and assumptions of the research questions, right? Um, the question that was asked about who does, is there an impact of the observer and the person who checks onto uh, outcomes? It was not part of their assumptions, right? Or maybe they assumed and didn't see anything uh, like that in their work. Identifying the variables and conditions of interest and then orienting the approach to analysis. Right. In their case, it was obvious that they had to, on the one, the one hand of their equation, you have um, those things that you think will vary, your independent variables, which is whether or not you have been undergoing treatment using the checklist. And then the outcomes were your mortality and morbidity uh, 30 days out. Make sense? Okay. And then the conceptual frame, framework, as we said earlier, is broader. So in that context, you would have a literature review, a summary of the relevant theory, an explanation of why this theory could be informative into the new context, a specific research question that likely contains a hypothesis, right? They hypothesized that the checklist would improve mortality and morbidity. And then a rationale for the research methodology adopted. In their case, it was a pre-post design and then a series of outcomes or variables of interest, right? So having, starting from your theory, building it up into a conceptual framework that has all of its pieces aligned, helps you do a very rigorous study. Sounds good? Okay. Now, subjectivist inductive research, which includes constructionist or constructivist, sorry, you, you've called it constructivist research. So what is it? As I've said earlier, inductive research involves going from specific data relating to a particular phenomenon to a general or abstract conceptualization of the phenomenon. Inductive researchers like myself work from data up to abstract conceptualizations. Subjectivist inductive research rests on two assumptions as well, right? That one, reality is socially and experientially constructed. And that two, to understand these realities, researchers need to explore the subjective experiences of individuals and groups, right? So someone like me is not saying that there's, there's not um, an apple out there that falls to the ground, right? But generally, I feel that the the things that are interesting as a social scientist are the things that are socially and experientially constructed and that I have only a limited ability to be fully objective about these realities. Okay, so I asked earlier who believed, um, like when we talked about the subjectivist inductivist assumptions, uh, subjectivist uh, objectivist um, assumptions, like now there were a few people who did not answer and uh, or um, said, eh, not so sure. How do you feel about the first claim now that reality is socially ex and experientially constructed? Is this a better sense that, is it a better statement of how you feel about the world out there? I had seen Matthew do a eh. Not sure reality is all that well defined there. Uh huh. So that's why I'm kind of 
<laughs> yeah. And these are really, really hard questions to answer, right? Like what is reality and in what context, what does which reality come in? Like my PhD supervisor always said, you know, like, yes, I'm a constructivist, but if I break my arm, I'm going to go to doc the doctor to fix it. You know, I'm not going to pretend that this is all in my head and not go seek medical attention. Right. Let's not talk about COVID right now, but uh, <laughs> right. So there is a reality out there and um, in different contexts, it might be very different. Right. So in our context of our response to this uh, distance, remote learning, right? Like what is reality? Well, yes, we're all sitting in front of a computer and that's a thing. Um, but the reality is beyond that, right? It's all that's happening within us. So there's lots of different versions of reality. And when you're a scientist, you have to decide which kind of reality you want to be studying, right? And um, for me, it was that version of reality. For other people, they make other decisions, right? If I can, I apparently as host of the meeting, I can't raise my hand, so I have to be ah. ready. <laughs> yes, Peggy. Just, just jump in. Can I jump in? Yes. <laughs> um, so there's actually some discussion uh, related to what I wanted to say in the chat. Um, and Omar asks, isn't it dependent on the phenomenon being obser observed, though? And I wondered as well, is it an either or, right? Like you may say yes to both of those questions, right? But yeah, I can uh, say Adam added to Omar's comment, can both be simultaneously true? Yes, absolutely. I think that they can both, uh, both be true, but in different contexts, right? Uh, and they, like why we make this distinction is because it's really useful for science, right? Um, to be able to say, okay, yes, I believe that um, I can measure compliance with a tool and that this is giving me useful information about the world that I can then mobilize for decision making and other things, right? Um, and then some other times you need different kinds of information. And what really matters in science is that you build research that is internally coherent to what you believe to be true, right? So um, for instance, in the field of software engineering, if you believe that uh, trace data gives you a full portrait of what's going on, then you will use this data and assume that it is giving you the true version of things, right? Because if you don't believe that this, um, this trace data is helping you understand what's truly going on, then there's no point in using it, right? You can't be basically saying what I care about experience, people's experiences of um, remote learning um, and just look at whether or not they're doing something different with their, while Zoom is running in the background with their computer, right? Um, you really I, need I to talk to them, please. Um, can I say something like about the, the trace data that you mentioned? But this um, this doesn't change the fact that uh, the actual trace data is the whole reality or not, if we assume it is. I'm not sure I understand what you're saying. Um, I mean that if you want to like mm -hmm. uh, if we use the trace data for like a, for a, for a particular purpose. And we assume this is like all the reality. The trace data is like what we like the whole um, data that we need, but the reality is different. This is that uh, that we don't know of. I mean, like by like by assuming this is the reality it doesn't change the facts that it is or it's not. No, but that's ab absolutely. But what you have to do in this context is make sure that the research question question you're, you are asking can be answered using the data that you're interested uh, in using, right? This is why this question of alignment is so important mm -hmm. and why we went into such depth um, trying to see what are the implications of, of theory uh, across different paradigms so that we can make sure that people are asking the right questions of the right kinds of data 
and making the right kinds of logical inferences from it, right? Um, so for instance, with trace data, you couldn't, you couldn't answer the question, are people actually learning? Yeah. Right? This is not, it, trace data will never give you a good answer to that question. It can give you an answer to the question, are people distracted when they're doing uh, online learning? Right? Because you will see them toggling between windows, you will see them chatting, you will see them uh, looking at cute gifts, you will be able to see that, but you won't be able to evaluate their learning. Yeah. Give me a second again for that um, <laughs> light switch. Yeah. They don't seem to love me. One second. Yeah, Suresh, did you um, did you have anything you wanted to say to that, or did that make sense to you? Um, it made sense, like uh, from the part that if. It, it, it really depends on the research questions that we ask yeah. because uh, that's sort of made sense because it's not like the trace data itself, it's not the whole reality because if we assume it is, and but if we ask the right research questions, I think that would solve this, this problem. Yes, and that's why I, I thought I, I really wanted to put the emphasis on the compatibility of objective and subjective data of inductive and deductive research, because there's not a there's not one perfect way of getting to all of this. Yeah. Right. What you have to do is the most perfect research project you can, given what you're trying to under, to um, understand, given the the data sources you have, given your assumptions about reality. Um, and then other people or other projects allow you to do a complementary version of this, right? And it, it's all together that we get the most accurate version of uh, what's really going on there. Good question though. Yes, fabulous questions. Okay, moving forward. I just wanted to ask one question. Yes, please. Yeah. So um, you just said that, um, you know, both are kind of, uh, are kind of valid and you uh, would maybe apply one in, a, in one domain and, and another in a different, but you still, you call yourself a subjectivist researcher and it's kind of a part of an identity and the question of whether you're subjective or objective, like you presented those questions to us, um, whether we believe in an external reality or not. So I'm not really sure how to phrase that, the question, but um, mm -hmm. it sort of, it seems more or less, um, less of a pragmatic, which one is better in the situation. Um, it can be that. You know what I'm trying it to say? can be that. Yes, I totally understand what you're saying, and um, I think that I can have this conversation with you guys because I've done a lot of philosophy of science in my life, and I'm more aware of all of these things than most people, right? But you will see a lot of people who have never really thought about the value of subjectivist inductive research at all because they've never been exposed to it, right? Um, people in physics, for instance, don't really have generally a good sense for why we should be doing subjectivist research, right? Um, people in, um, what's another extreme, anthropology generally will not think that it makes a lot of sense to um, do objectivist research, right? But in between those two extremes, there's a lot of people with different, lots of different kinds of views. And then there's people like me who are very pragmatists, um, who decide to use different kinds of methods for different kinds of, of projects. Um, and they, they, they get published. And that's why I'm stressing this alignment within studies, because that's really what is the, the hallmark of good science, right? That it is internally coherent. I think this is such an important discussion for us to have um, and that we don't typically have. And actually, I, I put a question in the chat. 
have mm -hmm. others in the class taken courses or have familiarity with philosophy of science? Have they come across these terms before, these concepts, this discussion? Oh, it's being covered this term in Engineering 297. Oh, Wonderful. Jonathan, can you tell us like what is that class and who's teaching you about that? Do you mind? Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not actually sure what the course title is. Uh, okay, I can look it up. <laughs> I'm just looking it up right now. I'm so sorry. Um, but uh, technology and society. Yeah, technology and society. That's the term. Yeah, yeah I've taught that class for. No, four years at Stanford, actually. I've taught a class like that. Uh, glad you're taking it. Glad you're taking it and that Yuvik is uh, suggesting um, that students take that. I think it's really important, uh, not only because I taught it, but because it forces you to think a bit outside the box of um, the usual engineering methodologies, right? Thanks, Jonathan. Yeah. I'm really glad that we're having this conversation. It was funny because when I told my, my colleagues that I was uh, presenting this, this research to um, an engineering class, they were like, oh my God, I hope they're theory interested. And clearly you guys are. So thanks for, uh, for, for delving into uh, this with me. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to do that. Okay, so if we go back to surgery now and we think about um, inductivist, uh, subjectivist research, what we see in this photo is, I think, part of the reason why we need this research as well. So what strikes you guys about this photo? Should I cold call or will people volunteer first? Uh, I'll, I'll volunteer. <laughs> I, I, I have no pride. I'll, I'll take the hit. Good. Uh, so is the situation here that the people in the crowd are students? Yes. This is the old way of teaching surgery. Good Lord. Um, so sorry, what was the question again about this? What do you see? What, so what do you see is like a, something that's puzzling. Like for you, you had no idea what this was, right? Yeah, it seems uh, a little weird. Um, like, it's not very learn by doing. It's learn by watching from really far away where you can barely see what's going on in something that's very small. Yeah. So what else? Cool to me. Yeah. Um, what I think is like uh, the students are learning from experienced doctors and they're getting their knowledge that how to do this operation and stuff like that. And this is uh, an inductive research that they're uh, taking a specific data, uh, data from these doctors and they're like, uh, like remembering or like uh, thinking of doing the future uh, operations like this so they can like, you know. Yeah, so it could be a model of inductive uh, learning right? Like you have data, you have this person cutting and this person manipulating the airways and the others are supposed to make a theory of what surgery is like by observing others, right? And Jonathan was like, whoa, that's a little bit scary. Like I, I don't really want my surgeons to be learning this way, right? Um, is there, uh, like Jordan, would you want to say what you see? Yeah, um, in this picture, I see just a lot of observation. So it looks like they're doing an operation and then the people who are watching are gaining the feedback. They're just getting the feedback from what they see and mm -hmm. they can make conclusions on based on what they see. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what I take from it. Yeah. Well, I, let, I'm gonna um, tell you what I see. Well, I see a single woman here. I see the youngest person here, the second youngest person here. And I see probably the staff surgeon doing a surgery here with the scalpel, right? And I see the teacher, right? This older person, the learned surgeon in the corner 
like explaining what's going on probably to a class of a whole bunch of men who are piled it, piled up and fairly casual, right? With his leg, legs up, I love that. So I see hierarchies, right? I see uh, a hierarchy of doing with the junior person doing certain, certain things, with the nurse doing certain other things, and with the authority of the eldest surgeon uh, displayed here, right? This is no longer the way surgical education is done, that part, right? Like we know about infections uh, and this is clearly pre-COVID. They're not wearing masks. Um, but this, is, this, is, this part of surgery is still very much the way it was back then in the 18th century, right? Uh, this is probably 19th century, sorry, right? But um, that hasn't changed. You have mostly men, uh, surgeons and mostly women uh, nurses, right? And it creates these interesting dynamics. So when we went in and we were studying the surgical safety checklist inductively, what we found really troubling, coming back to the question earlier about um, who records what has been done, is that in the initial studies, they had a checklist coordinator who used to be a man supported by a very powerful surgeon who was running the massive study with World Health Organization funding. And then in the practice of every day that we observed, it was actually the nurse who was supposed to record what was done and what was not done. And then she was supposed to enter that in an interface that would not let her submit the form unless she said that everything had been done. And then if she sque like squeezed something by and had not done it, you had a whole administrative system that went and weighed on her and breathed down her neck so that if she would change what she had recorded so that the hospital would not be penalized for having low compliance rates, right? So when you're someone like me who has observed something like this and you see the data that those surgeons had reported in the landmark 2010 study, you start ask, like being a bit less comfortable about this, this more top-down approach to data collection, right? Because in the real world, you have all of these hierarchies that we see visible here that come into play into what people can actually record on those forms, right? So the data is not fully objective. It is partly subjective. And when we interpret those data as a true representation of what is going on, rather than have some doubt on their validity, then we can run into troubles. I, I'm sorry, to interrupt yes, right please, I was done. I, I've seen that, the, I know, I recognize that's the picture, it's called the Agnew Clinic, and they were doing a, a mastectomy in the University of Pennsylvania. That's really cool. Thanks for bringing that up. Mm. So I would not have guessed that the patient there was a woman. So there's two women in the photo. It doesn't necessarily mean to be a woman. For the mastectomy, you're right. Yeah. You're right. Oh, it's it a man. Yeah. yeah. They do do mastectomies on men. Okay. So, um, I will skip through this fairly quickly because this is a bit too weedsy, I think, for you guys. You, you'll have the slide deck and you can uh, get back to it. It's in, also in the paper, but in inductive research, there's three core ways of using theory um, and they all have different implications. So you can look at that if you're interested. And um, the theoretical framework will have to start from this first decision to, as to how theory will be decided, will be used. And then the conceptual framework will have similar things as with the um, inductive, deductivist approach, but it will be much less fixed than in a deductivist objectivist study. So the, in, in the clinical sciences, um, the randomized control trial is the gold standard of objective research, right? And so you cannot modify your research design after you've decided because then it leads to a lot of um, 
potential fraud and misrepresentation, right? Whereas in, in inductive research, based on what you see on the grounds, you will adapt your conceptual framework and revisit all of that. So for the study of the checklist, for instance, we didn't know initially that we would find issues of compliance. But when we did, we had to learn more about that and build, it, build this literature into what we had found, right? And this is one of my like favorite things about research is that you start with something and then reality pushes back, right? You go in with your provisional understanding and then the world gets back at you and said, no, nope, you were wrong. And then you have to <laughs> reconsider everything and uh, make better sense of it. So it keeps you humble and on your toes. Okay, so um, as I said, initially, like it was very difficult for us to write this paper and we presented it at the uh, American Association of Medical Colleges uh, conference the first time in 2018, I think, 2000, no, 2019 summer. And it was a full house with more than 50 people coming for such an esoteric topic. We were uh, really, really pleased and people were angry. You know, they were really angry because people tend to have really strong views about what they, um, what theory is and how you should use it. And so we were forced, like, we felt the full force of people's anger uh, at us in front of this really large audience. But the paper has been extremely well received, like we've received 17 citations in less than a year. Um, and it's really been talked about a lot on social media. So um, it's really encouraging to us that the, all the hard work that went into writing this paper uh, helped some people and, and is making them talk about it. Uh, and for those of you who will consider going into academia, um, talking about you know this the, the, the social media response to your work, I think is, is a really good approach when you apply for scholarships or uh, promotions or jobs, you know, because there's yeah the, the formal roots of citations, but then um, the buzz that's created shows also the relevance of your work, right? So finally, to wrap this up, uh, what I hoped that I hope that you learned is to work, 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 work. Uh, it's a lot of work to use theory um, and uh, build strong theoretical and intellectual frameworks. Uh, second thing is that different research approaches will have different relationships to these concepts, um, theory, theoretical frameworks, and conceptual framework, and that you should really follow the norms of the tradition in which you participate, right? This alignment business that I talked about, that no one approach is better or the best, that they work together to push science forward, right? This is the, the balance of the objective, subjective, uh, inductive, deductive. It's all important that we work together in the joint uh, enterprise of science. And finally, it's really rewarding to do work that pushes people to reconsider their pre-existing knowledge, even if it's sometimes scary, but make sure that when you do that kind of work, you do it with collaborators who push you respectfully. There, um, there is a lot of unethical behavior in science, unfortunately. Um, and we have a, like a general duty to say no. So I wish it upon you to find those great people around you to, who inspire you to do the best work and lift you up and tolerate nothing else because you're worth it. So that, that's it for that. Wow, what a fantastic presentation. I think thank maybe you. we should turn our mics on for a minute and just clap. We do have time for a second. Aww, thank you guys. Yeah, or we do the sparkly hands or this from New Zealand, but. Oh, that's sweet. Yeah. Aww, love it. Uh, thank you so much. Sure. Uh, that was fantastic. Um, I think that you really made us all think, right? Which is something we could use a lot more of these days <laughs> um, to think about, you know, what we know and what and how we think about it and how we think about our research questions and our research in general. Um, the students have posted some questions and I'm going to give them a heads up that I will invite them to ask their own question. Uh, some already are doing so and I'll probably go in order that we have in Slack. Um, so just giving you a little heads up if you'd rather not ask I'm happy to do that for you. Um, I wanted to ask kind of a warm up question and I didn't really warn you about this. Um, so you have sort of moved areas or domains 
um, from looking at health education to software engineers. Um, how different is it? How similar is it? What has surprised you the most? And what brought you to cha this change in domain? Um, I, um, I really loved my work in healthcare. I, th I really loved it. I thought, you know, that it was important work, but it was often frustrating because healthcare is so regulated. And as someone who's not a clinician myself, I had very few levers I could pull for making change happen. Um, I also found it increasingly hard to support students in a job market that was difficult. So I was looking for um, a transition uh, in my role. I always knew that I, like I want, knew I wanted to stay in research, but I didn't know exactly what. And I got the opportunity at Facebook um, to do internal facing research that really helped me to transition my skill set studying healthcare teams to studying engineering teams. And I've always loved learning. So I was super excited to start learning about a new area, software engineering. Um, it's been good. It's been really good. I had to have a crash course on so many different things, you know, going from a nonprofit academic context uh, and uh, like teaching hospitals to a for profit company was very different, but I really love how privileged we are at Facebook to have so many resources to support our employees and to do really high quality research. Um, and because there are so many resources, people are actually not fighting one another over those resources, right? When you have a really small pie and you have to feed 50 people, people are really aggressive with their fork, right? Um, but when you have this massive pie and you can barely see the end of it, mm -hmm. uh, people you know, have what they need and then they can just ensure that they can work together and do the best work that they can. So it's been a very revealing uh, experience to me about some of the struggles of uh, contemporary healthcare uh, and higher education, right? Obviously, Facebook is an extreme, like very few corporations have th this many resources, um, but it's been it's been really lovely. Yeah, and I'll ask one more question before going to the student questions. So in our field of software engineering, there is a trend towards using um, review checklists and pre registration of studies where you have the research question well defined and you know exactly what your approach is going to be. What is your thought on those in a field where both the constructivist kind of approach um, can apply as well as the more kind of deductive, right? Objective deductive approach. What do you, what do you think of those? Well, I think that um, one thing that I did not appreciate as much as I do now at the beginning is how creative software development is as an activity right like it's not just robots pushing buttons right like trained monkeys would not be able to do it and so um i worry that the use of checklists or the over over standardization of research will be harmful i think it, it has a place as i said in randomized control trials or experiments right because it it's a good check against the the subjectivity of the researcher who wants a specific type of outcome um, so I'm all for that within those kinds of research traditions, but in the work that I and other um, inductivist researchers do, it's a real, real constraint, right? Because as I said earlier, like we never knew we would be doing research on compliance, mm -hmm. um, but it was so major that we had no choice but to do that, right? So if you expect every single person to follow a very narrow script for what research should be, you're limiting your ability to let the, word, the world push back, right? Which, will, as I said, is one of my favorite things about research. Mm -hmm. You think you know what you're doing and then the world tells you you're, you're clueless, mm -hmm. right? And that's the most rewarding thing for people who do research like I do, mm -hmm. uh, is to let the world speak to you, you know? So, um, you need, I think you do need it in some places, but in some other places, it's just orthogonal to good research. 
Mm -hmm. Thank you, Elise. Um, so looking at the questions, because the students read your paper and they prepared some questions for you, very thoughtful questions, and we'll see how many we get time to go through. Um, so I'm going to see if Sarosh would like to ask his question. He already started. Yeah, sure. Great. Thank you, Sarosh. Yeah. Um, so my question was about uh, uh, subjective indu inductive research context uh, in subjective inductive research, because in the paper, it's mentioned that uh, objective deductive uh, research approach must come to a specific um, uh, context. But it doesn't say anything about the context when we are doing inductive uh, approach. Uh, That's a, yes. Yeah. But like, I, I mean, like if the theory uh, is the output of our research, um, do we have to, are we like uh, supposed to say this is, this theory is only, uh, uh, can be accomplished in this context? Yes. So, okay. So, um, in, I think in the Schoberg um, article, you have learned that there's like theory applies at different levels, right? There's theories that make sense uh, in one specific context and not in others. And then there's some theory that apply more broadly, like gravity will apply everywhere you go on the planet, right? Like there's, there's no debate around that. Um, there are some things that might be more specific to your context. And then when you do inductive research and you start within your, when you do inductive research, you can't escape your context, right? No worries. Because you are collecting data in this context. So context is everything, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So whatever theory you create is about the specific people and context you have observed. Right. And yeah. that's what you do. And we'll talk about this in my other talk. It's like what you have your pr uh, preliminary theory that represents what you've seen in that context. Mm -hmm. And then you give it up to the universe to test it in other places. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's what uh, then the deductive people can do. It's like they see, oh, theory, they found that in the operating room. What if I brought it into family medicine? Does mm -hmm. it apply there? Mm -hmm. And then they'll try. And if they, fa they fail to reproduce it, then it says, like, oh, well, me, the inductive researcher can say, well, it failed in this context. How does it actually work in this context? And then they do their work in the context of family medicine, and then they revise the theory that is then able to be tested by the deductive people, right? Mm -hmm. So you see there's a cycle like this. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and sometimes it's the other way around. There's some very exploratory uh, quantitative research for instance about factor analysis and, and these for like factor analysis that can tell you oh there seems to be something there and then an inductivist can uh, go in the specific context and see the manifestation of this finding right yeah yeah thank you my pleasure great, great question sir uh jordan uh do you would you like sure. to ask a question? thank you yeah um so i think my question fell along the lines of, so researchers are encouraged to make early explicit decisions as to when and how they will use their theory in their research. Um, I was just wondering, how does a researcher determine the appropriate time to make this decision? And like, what information do they need to, in order to make that decision? To That's be early? a really super great question. So um, sometimes, you do a project because the, you're interested in using a specific theory in a context, right? So when we started this surgical safety research, we were interested in looking specifically at what um, a framework that, that talks about the difference between what a policy says should happen and what actually happens in practice, right? So what we had done is write a grant that described what the theory said, described how um, we were applying it in, in practice, and then our, our research methods were all in line, right? Because to be able to observe the gap between a policy and the practice, you have to have data on the policy and you have to have data on the practice, and then you compare these two, right? So that's an example where you know ahead of time that you want to use a theory as I said, like the guy with his vial, right, to illuminate 
something different, mm -hmm. right? And that's what we wanted to do initially with this project. And we collected our data and we did all of this and we have a list of places where the practice did not match the theory and we have a paper about this. But then for a sub project of this, like the compliance part, we were not expecting that, right? So we could not bring an initial theory to this. But when we decided that we needed more data about this, that okay, now we're collecting more data. What is our, what will be our use of theory in that space? And we had to go to the literature on compliance, right? But it could not come at the beginning because we were past that. So of all the options, it always depends on what you wanna do. You've talked last week about grounded theory, right? Grounded theory, there's two, two types, one that is really anchored in go all into the field, learn nothing beforehand, just let yourself be influenced by what you see. That's mm -hmm. a traditional grounded theory. And then you have the constructivist grounded theory where you start with theory. You recognize that you have pre-existing knowledge and you bring this to the field and you're gonna build upon that with your observation. Okay. Yeah. Right? Um, and like when you're a beginning researcher, it's really hard to know when to do what. And that's why you have supervisors who help you uh, and guide you along this path, right? To do the right thing at the right time. But there's again, no right approach. It's, it's about using the right approach in a specific context with a specific research question. Yeah, that makes, that makes sense. Thank you. Great question. Thank you. Um, we do have a few more questions and some really good ones. How are you doing, Elise? Are you I'm doing good. Right? We're, 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 we're a bit over time. So like, depending on how you are doing about the, the well, time. I, I, I like the questions and I like that the students thought of them. So maybe we'll, uh, we'll go for a few I'm more. Ready. Um, yeah, excellent. And your light's still yes. on. <laughs> Magic. <laughs> <laughs> It'll go off. Um, is Dave there? Would he like to ask uh, one of us? He posted two. Maybe you could ask one if he's there. I'd give him a second to see. If not, maybe Zane would like to jump in. I don't see Dave. Maybe if he wants to come in. I'm here to see our mic got disconnected. Okay, um, no worries. <laughs> sure, I guess. Um, so one part of the paper said that deductive research, like the, uh, the theory has always, like assuming the theory is part of the uh, object of the research, is there something else that's like disconnected, like something that's not part of objective of the uh, research? Something that's theory related that is deductive research? Yeah, and the theory has always been like, you know, an objective of the research. Is there like a like some like any type of research that the theory is not part of it? Um, for deductive thinking, huh? Um, I think that um, there's a lot of um, I. I'm trying to think. Because my, my, my initial gut reaction is that bad deductive theory does not, <laughs> the deductive research does not start with theory, but that's not really kind. Um, and then I thought, you know, there's a lot of data mining or big data um, approaches that I thought about, but those tend to be inductive, right? Like they're, and that's one of the main criticisms of big data as a field is that it's not really scientific because it doesn't start from these, um, this theory, right? So, um, I think it's a super interesting question. Yeah. To jump in. I think that sometimes, you know, in some of the papers or the research that I read about, the theory is implicit. There is a theory, but it's almost as if, you know, it's not spoken about, as if it's assumed. I don't know if that would, would get at what Dave was asking about. I'm just Yes, and I, well, does it, Dave? Like, do you, do you feel that this speaks to you? Um, because I do data science stuff. Like, I'm doing a database for like a long time. And everything. It's less about theory and more about objective. Like, what you want to accomplish instead of saying that you know we have to speed up a system because in theory that's good for you to you know, access data and stuff like that. 
So if there's more about that going on, you might like affect the life. So I was wondering if that's the, uh, like in, in the scientific community, is that something else? Like an, another side of it? Because in the paper, like the, the part where I found interesting is that you know, in the, uh, the doctor research that uses theory saying that in this approach, a central assumption is that the theory is part of the uh, object research. In other words, the, the hypothesis being tested is an aspect of the theory of interest. So is there like something that's not like correlated in, in that regard? I, I love what you're getting to here. And um, Peggy made me read some, some stuff that really uh, tickled my, my neuron uh, in this space in like the, the tensions between a lot of what engineering does and yeah. the scientific mindset, right? Yeah. Engineering uh, engineers are often, and data scientists are part of that, are often interested in doing things, in building things, in accomplishing things, in making things work, right? Yeah. And um, same thing in medicine, right? Like we want things to work. We want people to be healthy. We want to save lives, right? So, um, but there is a tension between the scientific method and this result-oriented framework. And it doesn't mean that it's not important to do things and, and build apps and save lives, right? But it's different um, approaches. Yeah. Um, and in my work at Facebook, um, I often have to slow down the data scientists, <laughs> right? Because they just want to build the, the, uh, the dashboard. They want to have an interface that represents what's going on. And I'm like, Yes, but what are you trying to measure? Is this thing the best thing to measure, right? And that's what science is, tries to do. It tries to tell you, okay, what are your assumptions when you're um, like a big concept that they wanted to, uh, to measure was um, disruption, yeah. right? And interruptions in work. Well, is a toggle between apps always a distraction or is it part of one workflow? And when would you know that this is not a workflow, uh, that this is a shift in workflow, right? Like sometimes you use your chat app because you are stuck and there's no way for you to progress in your work unless you ping the senior engineer on your team and they give you the answer to the problem you have. It's not a, a cognitive switch in this context, yeah. right? But the data scientists assume that if you have a toggle between apps, you have context switching. Well, no, right? And it's my job as a scientist to come and tell them, you know, like what, what would be our ideal way of getting to these things, okay. right? Mm -hmm. And that's why I think it's so important for all of us to work together, oh, okay. right? Because you have someone like me who's gonna force you to slow down and then you're gonna be, wow, something magical happens that I would never make, be able to make happen, Yeah. right? Yeah. Great okay. question, Dave. Uh, Amazing. Yeah. Very yeah, interesting uh, topic. So, yeah. 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 Uh, Zane, you, you, people have been voting your question up since you posted it. So would you like to jump in? Uh, yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So my question was uh, uh, regarding, so for, you know, junior researchers or researchers who may be uh, inexperienced, does it mean that you know, for like, for example, theory informing inductive analysis where uh, your study design changes, you know, your iterations changes depending on the insights or new things that you learn. Does this mean that like this type of, uh, this type of approach is better for inexperienced researchers because, you know, you're, you're building experience and you, as you are applying these different methods, or is it like, um, or is there a different approach that is better in this type of scenario? What I find is that we all have very different brains, you know, and there's some people who are excellent at deductive type research and some people who are excellent at inductive type research. So what I think any junior person needs to do is do a bit of both, you know, like try their hands at a lot of different things, like try to do surveys, try to do interviews, try to do data tracing, try to do controlled experiments, try to do all of these things. And then like realize how, where's your brain 
happy, happiest and most productive and excited and because ultimately that's what you need for a career in science, right? It's a lot of drive and you're going to spend so many hours doing what you, you will be doing that finding the thing that gets you excited and gets you like, yes, I want to tell the world about all that I have done is what truly matters. So um, when you're good at something, and when you are moved by it is where you should go. But the, the early stages, try everything. Try everything and see what, what, what moves you. Thanks. Yeah, great. Thanks, Zane. Uh, Matt, we've got two more questions and then we'll take a break. Matt, would you like to jump in? We've seen you already. Um, I guess it's sort of similar to what we were talking about before, so I hope I'm not beating yeah. a dead horse. Um, well, we can skip it if you feel it was covered, but you know, if you want to ask a follow on, that's fine too. Sure. Um, maybe not quite covered. Um, so in your paper, um, you kind of explained how theory, theoretical framework and conceptual framework are applied in different methods, namely the, um, um, objectivist, deductive versus um, subjective in, inductive. I'm just wondering how much does the um, paradigm really matter there? Because it seems like the differences are in terms of, of uh, procedure or method. Um, so if, for example, you had um, an objectivist researcher doing an inductive approach, which I imagine happens, um, how would that change? So, so um, as I said earlier, it, these are spectrums, right? Spectra. So you have inductive, deductive, and people fall on the spectrum. Then you have objectivist, deductive, uh, objectivist, uh, subjectivist, and you fall on the spectrum, right? What is really hard is when someone is at one end of the spectrum, but does not fully know it and is trying to do something at the other end of the spectrum. That is really hard because that's not the right way of thinking, right? So if you try to apply experimental standards to an observational study of the kind that I do, so in ethnography, right, you're going to be focused on the wrong things. You know, like my, I never count things in, uh, well, rarely count things in my, my research because my questions are more about how, you know, how do people make sense of, how do, they, how do people comply with, how does the practice of the checklist vary from its policy? And these are not countable things, right? Um, so people tend to cluster in, in one of these paradigms uh, based on what they're generally interested in. Um, and people get into trouble when they, they're not fully a right fit for it. And they're trying to do a hybrid version. Does that help? Yeah, that helps. I think, yeah. Um, it's, it's really hard to do like, uh, to do good research when you're not within a tradition, right? And that's why those traditions are there is because we want to speak the same language. Um, and we share some assumptions about the way th things should be done. What is rigor? What matters? Uh, how should data be presented, collected, all of that? Yeah, thanks. A, a good question. And it comes up, I think, when people are reviewing a paper too, that they're at one end of the spectrum and they're reviewing a paper from the other and they don't quite realize it. Um, Alessandra's question is really good, but I'm going to hold on it because it actually relates more to your second presentation that you're going to give later this afternoon and it is three o'clock. So um, again, I'd just like uh, everybody to thank Elise and all of the people that great, gave uh, good questions here today for, I think, one of the best discussions I have ever had about the role of theory um, and theoretical frameworks and conceptual frameworks in uh, software engineering. So thank you very much, all of you. Uh, yes, thank I think you. You've been, you've been such troopers. Like, I'm really, really impressed by the quality of your, your questions and your engagement. Like, you, you guys are on top of it, clearly. So brilliant.
Wow. Two thumbs up.